Beautiful video, beautiful. Hello world, you are here with your boy Bill Hamid and uh, some special friends of mine, some very special people, our head coach at DC United, Mr. Ben Olsen, our, one of our former players, uh, Costa Rican World Cup veteran, uh, Mr. Ronnie Wallace, um, the best ever spoken word artist I've ever met and the number one in the country, Miss Charity Blackwell. And one of my other former teammates, Charlie Davies, a US, a former US international, a legend in the game that is still making waves in our soccer community. So thank you guys for uh, agreeing to being on this critical conversation. It's uh, something that we obviously do need to talk about the open dialogue of racism in America is a subject that um, we're here for today. And it's tough. It's tough with times right now, what's going on in the world. Um, there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of media attention on, on the things that have happened. And, uh, and Black Lives Matter, the movement has been so strong in unifying people and bringing people together. So to start with you, Charity, um, your background from South Carolina, the South, a beautiful place. How was that dynamic for you growing up? How was it um, as a young black lady in the South, in South Carolina? And what were some of the systemic racism issues that kind of plagued your community? Um, wow, where to start? So growing up in Rock Hill, South Cackalack was um, an interesting experience, especially when it came to race and um, growing up, especially having a father that was uh, president of the NAACP at the Rock Hill chapter. So um, always also looking at it from that lens, it was a very um, interesting experience. And I kind of was touching on it earlier in conversation, um, how blatantly racist it was and how embedded it was in the culture at times, I sometimes didn't even realize that I was experiencing a lot of racism because it was something that just seemed to be natural and part of the everyday life. Um, growing up in in a, a high school where Confederate flags being worn to classrooms um, all over pickup trucks, um, coming out of basketball practice and uh, people riding around in trucks with hoods on, um, like they're in a, a KKK hoods screaming out derogatory terms. Um, it was it was just uh, something that happened often. And it was a feeling of like knowing it was wrong, but but kind of like always feeling, well, oh, that's just that's the South. That's 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 part of being here. Um, yeah. My dad being president in NAACP, um, I know that I, my experience was a little bit different from folks because he was trying to make a lot of change. Uh, he Removing the Confederate flag from the Capitol building was one of his biggest initiatives. And you know, thinking that getting phone calls where he was getting threat threats from people um, became a norm. Um, him coming home and like putting down the, um, the, the uh, blinds because he felt like he was being followed um, mm -hmm. was a norm. And so, it was a it was a unique experience because I think any any black person growing up from the in the south um, from where I was raised could say that they experienced some form of racism. But I think particularly from my my perspective, um, it was it was pretty unique when you have someone who's also trying to actively create change in a, a highly highly activated area full of just racism and hatred. So that was my experience growing up, but kind of looking forward now um, and seeing that I, as I follow a lot of people that I went to school with and I saw a post where someone said Rock Hill had a, pro had a protest, had a march, and I would have never in a million years ever thought that a march would actually ever happen. Beautiful anywhere close to Rock Hill, South Carolina. So to even hear that, and I, and I saw comments where people were like, oh, that 
that joint was weak. It was like 10 people there. Da, da, da. I mean, it may have been weak, but the fact that it happened to me speaks volumes. So, it does. yeah. It does. And that's beautiful. Definitely commend and salute your father, uh, president of the NAACP and the changes that he made. And I'm, I bet that was very difficult to go through uh, feeling that people were following him. Um, Rodney. Talk my to man. Me, baby. So good? as a as a young black and Latino man growing up mm. in, in the DMV area, it's that's a few different things against you. You know, a few different things that you'd have to deal with. And I can imagine there were some things that uh, probably uh, weren't the right things either said to you or done to you when you were growing up. So um, if you were to give messages to young kids out there, um, what message would you give a young black and Latino kid and if he's dealing with people around him that are racist or showing some sort of hate towards him? Well, yeah, personally, you know, being from Costa Rica, being black in Costa Rica, being black in America, at the end of the day, it's it's all the same. So you're you're black there, you're black here. People are going to view you as a black man no matter what. So if it's racism, it's racism wherever it is. So I feel like I had it both ways. Like You know what I mean? It's uh, it was one of those things where just because I was in Costa Rica, I wasn't going to feel that, you know, over there, the culture is different. I actually sometimes feel it more. But uh, in the States, I mean, you know, as kids, we, we, we dealt with it all the time. I mean, we can sit here right now and, and come up with five, five things that happened to, to us in our childhood. And, and we can all relate to that same thing. You know what I mean? Out, we out competed the, the, the white kid and the white kid dropped the end bomb, things like that. And those are normal things that as kids we experienced. And it wasn't just me. It wasn't just you. It was, it was a lot of us. And it's, it, it's not like we were numb to it. It actually, it actually stuck with us and it made us into the, into the people that we are now. You know what I mean? It's like those experiences stuck with us and there were consequences out of those, out of those uh, scenarios when we were kids. And those are things now that we have to fix. And I think that uh, representing the Latino community, the black community, I would, I would tell a, a young kid that was in the same shoes that I'm in right now, I would, I would tell him to stand up for for what's right. I would tell him to to cut that right where it is because if you bottle it in, it it just becomes you either you either take it all the time and then you express it in a different way, yeah. or or you just keep it and then that's that's you define yourself as as that word or you define yourself as as somebody that's less or you don't even take chances because you think that you're automatically going to be shut down. So mm. me personally, I, I try to always cut it at the root right, right there. You know what I mean? But it mm. happens, things happen so often that, you know, after a while, sometimes you just, you just do it out of pleasing um, somebody else. You don't want to make somebody else feel uncomfortable. You know what I mean? It's, it, it's weird like that, but with everything that's going on right now, I think that it's important for those parents as well to educate the, the kids on what's going on, especially, I, and that's an interesting point. I think that Latino parents have to, have to keep a, a close, they have, to, they have to watch and they have to know what's going on and educate uh, the Latino community as well. And if you're black and Latino, you know what I mean? You're gonna, you're gonna get hate. Yeah. So educate the kids and let them know exactly what's going on because at the end of the day, you're gonna be in an elevator. Me, for example, being a black kid, mm -hmm. some people didn't know I spoke Spanish. So I'm in an elevator and maybe a Latino, uh, a group of Latino friends says something to me, but they don't think that I understood. So then that's, you know, those are things that I had to deal with. And, and some young kids today might not know how to deal with that. And that's why all these protests, everything that's happening, it's happening so that they can live a better life. So for me, educating, cutting it at the root and not pleasing the situation, not pleasing the, uh, a person not trying to not trying to say anything because you want to make somebody else feel comfortable no that that just makes you keep those feelings in so you have to be able to express exactly how you feel at that time 
Yeah, beautiful message. I definitely agree. It does start now with the kids, with the youth, you know, educating them on togetherness because, you know, we're getting a little older, us five, you know, but it's them that come after us. If we can give them the education now and have them learn how to live together as one, then hopefully down the road when we're in our 80s, 90s, or when our time is gone, it's a different world and a better world. But speaking about the yep. kids, we have some fathers here. Uh, Charlie Davies uh, has, uh, is it two boys? Yeah, two boys. Two Twins. boys. Uh, yeah. ben, Coach Ben has uh, a, a daughter and two sons, and Ronnie has a daughter also. So as fathers. True, true. Oh, oh, just has, uh, apologies. Oh, apologies. No, perdón, please, Congratulations, by the way, big cat. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. It's been a year, bro. You're pulling out on me, man. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. He said, he said thank Thanks, Bill. Bill. <laughs> you graduated, Bill. Thanks, in, appreciate it. He's in high school, but yeah. So, as fathers, during this time, obviously lots going on. There's also been a lockdown. So... <laughs> The kids have seen so much this year. It's been, I, I, could, I could tell it's been a trying time as a, as a parent during these times. So um, open dialogue, please answer however you like. How, how have you guys spoken to your kids, told your kids how things are, what is going on and you know, how have you educated them on the, the issues? I think I, I've been in a unique situation um, from, from Ben and Rodney because their, their kids are a little bit older. Mine are four years old and they still just think life is about fun, playing with toys, um, having a yeah. good time. And, and they're happy that I'm, I'm home all the time. I'm not traveling. So yeah. I, for me, it's, it's just making sure I'm there. I'm, I'm 100% committed to just being a great dad, being a great parent and a husband. And at the same time, you have all this <sighs> All of this, these these horrible things happening in, in not only our country but the world, right? And racism is a global is a global problem. It's not just the United States. And I've seen some of the guys I've played with in Europe, you know, with their their tweets and Facebook, uh, yeah. you know, saying that you know it's I feel horrible that this is happening in the United States. You know, I played there, and you know things need to get better. But it's it's not just the U.S. It's I've felt it in Europe too. You know, it's a global problem. Uh, and and I think growing up, I I compartmentalized, compartmentalized everything. You know, it was keep it internal, don't react. Because I was taught by my dad that if someone says something hateful to you, don't give them the satisfaction that it hurts you. You got to be a rock. You got to keep moving forward. And so that's what I, how I reacted. I said, you know what? They can say whatever they want. I can't let them show it hurts me. Even though it does, I never let them know it did. And I kept yeah. moving, kept fighting. And as, as far as I could go, I knew I was going to win if I stayed focused. And I never thought things could change. Just like, um, you know, what Rodney said, you keep it inside. You don't al allow people to say anything. And I never thought that we would see what we're seeing now, where people all come together from all different walks of life yeah. to, to to say, we're done with this. We're going to make a stand. So now I, I have that that hope that Things will change because we haven't seen this before, not to this level. And it's not just black people. Finally, we realize to really have change, it's got to be everyone, not just black people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been the biggest difference. And that gives me hope. And that also, I, I think about my kids growing up that I don't want them to have to deal with this, where you look at someone and and you think, oh man, they're thinking of me in a certain way, or they're thinking of me in a certain way because because my father's black. I don't, I don't want them to have to go through that. Now, mm -hmm. Can I control what other people say to them or what other people think? No, but I can educate them. I can be as, as, as helpful as I can to the community, to kids, to help them understand life and what, what's coming at you. Um, and, and you hope that other kids in our generation who, who are fathers can tell their kids the same thing. And I really feel that this generation and the next will make that change. It yeah. At least to me right now, it looks like we're moving in the right direction. We're at least having movement, which we haven't had before in the past. Yeah. Ben, ben I don't you. think we can hear you. Sorry, guys. I was uh, captivated by listening. Um, let me let me say this quickly. Uh, uh, my conversations with my children, I'm, I, I realize 
by by listening to a lot of neighbors uh, and uh, people over the last couple week, uh, weeks, they're a lot easier than the ones that Rodney and, and Charlie have to have uh, and, and many of my neighbors uh, in the Shaw community. Uh, and I, I don't know if it was the right thing or, or, the, or the wrong thing as a, a, a parent, but I was watching the news and the, the children were around, uh, an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a, and a, a, a 5-year-old. And uh, I let them watch the the incident and you know it was uncomfortable and and i'm not sure again it was the right thing but i i felt compelled for them to see uh uh what what's going on you know i can talk to them at the kitchen table and i i can uh give them uh my best version of this uh but i let them watch it and the next day they got up and they made signs and they went yeah. down and they photocopied signs uh, and they made probably 20 each and they went out in the community in Shaw and they put them up on uh, telephone poles. They went into stores. They asked if they could hang these signs up. So uh, a lot of my focus has been uh, on them and making sure that the, 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 the next generations uh, uh, are, are making this better. And it's a, um, as as a white person, it's a uh, you know I, I am trying to fight off guilt right now because I I think guilt is selfish in these times, uh, and uh, it, but I think it's it's easy to have that as a white person in these moments and get caught up in that, and I'm trying to steer that emotion now to change and what can I do now not. What did I not do and, and beat myself up for all the uh, not having my eyes fully open? Uh, but to me, it's about now keeping my eyes open and not just waiting for the next incident uh, of police brutality to now be outraged and ang angry again. So uh, what can I do now as a leader with my players, as a, uh, as a, as a person in a, in, a, in a very diverse community, uh, whether it's um, and, and at the club, whether we're hiring uh, a, a diverse, uh, a diverse, having a diverse staff, uh, there's a there's a lot that I can do, and uh, it's been a, a, again a, a very uh, a very eye opening experience the last couple of weeks. Bill, I'm curious to hear your side uh, of things. What has it been like for you, being a young black kid in the DMV, growing up, and seeing it? You know, you, you were a very successful professional soccer player, but what was it like to get to that point? And how has it been since in the DMV? Your your uh, audio seems to be off for a sec. Sorry, guys. You hear All me right. now? Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was tough in, in Virginia, you know, growing up uh, and going to school in Woodbridge. Um, most people in Virginia would have labeled Woodbridge is the beginning of the South. It's where Nova finishes and you start to see a lot more farmlands and it's just a little bit different in terms of uh, the society and the culture um, from Northern Virginia and DC. So, you know, going to school out there, um, I ended up going to uh, an evangelical school, which is ironic primarily because my mom was a private nurse for an old, uh, an old couple uh, a, a couple named Bill and Natalie Robinson. Um, and through that agency, um, they were able to give options to a lot of the private nurses um, um, to give the ability for their kids to go to a school, um, a Christian school or a, a private school nearby uh, where that um, private nurse was working uh, on a daily basis. So my parents took advantage of that because uh, one, it was a private education, a private institution education, and um, it was free. And, and we had the ability to do that. And my mom was, it was very easy for her to pick me up from school, take me back to the house until she puts them to bed around eight, and then we go home. And that was my elementary school. So I got to see a lot of different things in, in that sort of institution. And it was a little cutthroat from, you know, different, different forms of Christianity that I know. Um, but it was tough still, you know, because, um, a lot of 
situations happen with teachers, students, and you know, sometimes I got in trouble, sometimes I was just naughty, but then sometimes I noticed my parents were fighting for me, having my back and telling me things in the car, like don't let anybody ever pick on you. I remember one talk I had with my mom, um, it was like second or third grades. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I remember for the first time in my life, out of all the beatings I got for being a bad boy, my mom told me for the first time to fight back if somebody ever tries to take advantage of you. And just hearing that, you know, the, the first for the first time in my life, I just I never heard my mom tell me to fight back against against people. You know, she always told me to listen, be quiet, be a, be be still, be calm, focus on your on your studies. But for once, after this one situation that happened, my mom told me, don't ever let anybody pick on you. Make sure you fight back if every if anybody is purposely picking on you. I took that. I, I took that and I ran with that for the rest of my life. So, um, you know, the DMV has changed. You know, the DMV now is quite diverse. There's a lot of people from different cultures, a lot of implants, obviously, because the government's here. So a lot of work is available. But, you know, in the past, it was a little different. And um, I'm, I, I like the direction that it's going. There's still a lot of uh, systemic issues that we have to deal with. But I like the direction that the that our area has taken in the last uh, decade or so. Bill, Bill, could you could you talk a little bit about your your weekend? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. Yeah. I saw you Monday. I saw you Monday morning at, at practice, and uh, I was exhausted. You were wiped out. You were wiped <laughs> out physically, emotional. I played well though. Was, I played well. Yeah. Uh, listen, that that uh, yes, always, always. But it, it was. You know, again, another reminder of, of, of what people are going through watching you on Monday morning and how heavy this is for you. Yeah. I know see out marketing and you're such a you're using your platform in, in such a, a, a wonderful way right now. Uh, what, yeah. what, what was the weekend? I was out there both days. You know, I live I live right next to right off of 16th Street, right across from Meridian Park. So I'm able to walk out of my house. The, they had a whole set up a whole meeting spot ready uh, at Meridian Park um, on Saturday. Chris Adoy came over, had a lot of people come over. We, we made a probably like a 17 to 20 person group. All together, we made signs in the apartment before we left, met up with everybody. It was the most beautiful thing I've seen in my life, honestly, to see one, such a huge statement being put on 16th Street leading up to the White House with this administration in office right now. I think that, I think Muriel Bowser, she, you know, a lot of people are, are cutting or are, are saying a lot of different things like, um, you know, what's next? This is just a, a street sign. But I think it's bigger than a street sign. I think this is something that resonates around the world. And the more I thought about that on the walk and the more that I saw the diversity in the crowd, uh, different people fighting for black lives, for the people that lost their lives, that were murdered. Um, I, honestly, I, I was in shock. I, I Looking around, seeing Asian people, white people, Spanish people, old, young, kids, children out there yelling, children, four years old, walking around with a fist, up, with a fist in the air, old people, on people in wheelchairs, this wasn't gonna. This cause wasn't gonna stop anybody in this area from getting out of their house and walking down 16th Street up to that makeshift fence and making their voice heard the whole weekend. So I was there the whole weekend, and um, it's the it's. This is gonna be me and Chris when when Chris, after we finished Saturday and Chris left my house, we said, man, if we get a photo from this, we have to frame it. Because when we're 80 years old and looking back at this, we're going to remember the fact that we were here together on this day. And honestly, for me, it was and the fight doesn't stop. I think that needs to be one of the messages right now is just because this weekend happened, they had one planned major protest. They have two more planned in uh, this month in August. The fight doesn't stop here. You know, that has to be the case. We have to continue fighting, continue fighting against police, police reform. That's very, very important. There's a lot of talks about defunding police departments. There's a lot of talks about reforming the police department. Some people have 
which one they prefer. I think both, both are possible. Both are possible. We, we can live with police as long as they do the right thing, you know? Charity. So even, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm curious, um, you know, just a lot of people think that it's, it's just about police brutality. And it's, it, it opened up to the bigger picture, right? Which is the system and how it's broken, right? What changes, immediate changes you think are needed to start having, the, start to see a positive reaction and start to put people in a place to succeed? It's a beautiful, amazing question. And I will be glad to answer that. Um, so I think that, and I've been having a lot of discussions about this lately um, in the workplace, amongst my community of folks that I talk to, family members. And there's, there's a lot of different things that definitely need to be addressed. And and you can see it. That, like I think that this um, recent incident and all these protests and the reaction from uh, the horrible death of George Floyd has sparked conversations that have been needed that have been swept under the rug I think for a long time but now are coming to surface and it's, it's forcing people to really reflect and take a step back and um, do some educating with themselves and I think that is for me step one and it's and it's no shade to anybody but it's not your black coworker or your black teammate or your black homies job to educate you. I think there there is some level of accountability for people to get out there and actually do some research, do some reading, do some 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 reflection on self, you know, because I think that a lot of times some folks might think, "Well, you know, I'm not racist. I'm 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 not uh I'm, I don't have a racist bone in my body. And this, and you, you know, and you probably may think that, but I, you know, there are things that are called microaggressions. You might do some things that may come off passive and are actually offensive to folks and you don't even know. So I think doing self-reflection, doing educate, educating, and actually all these missions and all these statements, um, not allowing them to be performative allyship. I think that if you're going to make missions, if you're going to, paint streets and murals and make protests and make a lot of policies and uh, put out there to the media and the world that we stand here and this is what we're going to do, actually do the work, like what Ben was saying, which I, I really appreciate, like doing some reflection on your staff, do, do some reflection on um, what's happening within your organization. I think it starts at home, it starts at your workplace, and it starts at um, really starting from within so that then your your actions can be well intended and and genuine and in the right direction i think everything that's happening right now is a good first step and i'm not the time to i'm not gonna i'm not the pessimistic type to be like oh this is you know forget all the protests and everything that's happening i think these are very important things that have to happen you know that's uh i think someone I saw a video on um, Instagram. I can't remember who it was. This guy named Kendrick, um, but he was ha having a very interesting conversation with a news reporter. And he said, the protest is the PR. The protest is letting you know that we we he we see you, we hear you, and we're out here. But the real work has to get done from the people. And that's what um, has to happen with everybody. And like you said, this it's not just the black community. It's all communities having to come together. And um, people that benefit from white privilege do just have to kind of um, also do some soul searching and research themselves and do things like what Ben um, said earlier. You know, I don't, um, I'm not against what you did with your children. I think that was very brave of you. And I think that also that is something that is very needed. Being able to sit in discomfort is needed because the discomfort that your kids saw the discomfort that you feel when you have these conversations is the discomfort that African Americans feel every day. So it's important to be able to have that perspective and not saying you have to show murders of all unarmed black men to all your kids, but but when you do feel uncomfortable, instead of running from it, which I see a lot of 
white co- white counterparts doing like oh this this is this is getting too racy for me let me let me get away like actually sit in it and then ask yourself why did why did that make me feel uncomfortable why why am i a little turned off from this conversation you know so long-winded answer charlie but no uh, yeah. it, well it, it it's a good thing because now i want to talk to to rodney and ben this first rodney you know my my year in DC United in 2011 was one of the best years of my career, hands down. Uh, the the locker room fantastic, playing in RFK, the history surround RFK and MLS, the the supporters, the city of, D, of DC. I loved everything about it. Rodney, can you tell me how you felt being a professional in your first professional experience with DC United? How you felt the love from not only the locker room but the teammates? How can we use that? that love, that, that feeling and move it to how we feel off the field and that comfort level. How can we spread how we feel when we're playing and in that environment to now everyday life? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's funny what Bill, Bill was talking about the protest. And as he was talking about it, I'm like, this is, this is like playing it. This is like a game. This is like playing a game. You know, you're out there, but the moment is, the moment is so big that it gives you sometimes it, it just gives you chills for me for example seeing all these protests and seeing the numbers that are that are showing up it's like i want to i want to go out there i want to feel that i want to i want to be out there and i want to feel it like like it's a game you know what i mean it's uh it's something that that is that that fills me you know what i mean cuz i was just like a lot of us we were we we're tired we were you know we were held down and and to be able to see people rise up like that, for me, it was it, it's like a moment of hype where it's like, yo, this is this is exactly what I want to do. This is where I want to be. I want to represent my people. And within the locker room culture and in a and a team setting, us players have the upper hand in in rela- in, in passing passing those messages across to to masses. I think that as organizations, as as individual players, it's I wouldn't, it's up to us. It's up to us to to lead the way and to join the 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 people, to join the movements, and to and to donate what or to give back or to support. It, it's it's up to us because people see our they see us on social media. They see what we're doing. They come to our games. So, what can we do as a group, as a team, as a league, as as a whole sport, as a whole? you know, organization, what can we do to, to really change? Not to, not to just say we're united in this, you know what I mean? And then things go back to normal where players are getting monkey chants in one stadium and then the other player, you know, is being called the N word and on the field. No, what can we do for this to end? Like Charity said, you know, the, the, the PR is being done. What can we do out on the field? You know what I mean? What can we do out there for this to, finally be done with because we're sick of it and we're sick of hearing it and either hiding from it or hearing it and then having to react and then people say oh he's crazy he's going off right now you know what i mean so it's like it's a situation where we never win so it's it's up to it's up to us to really take charge in this situation and really change the whole thing whether it's that- black whether it's white we got to we got to do what we have to do to uh to change it. And Ben, you came you into know. the squad that, and when you think of your DC United squads, I'm talking diversity. And you had, you know, some of the black role models like of this country, you know, Eddie Pope and you know, Roy Lassiter. And you you talked about playing with Clyde Sims and, you know, some of these, these players, Eddie, these black players, Eddie Johnson, some of these black players that, that really have, have motivated and inspired young black kids to play the game. But I always watched your squads, and I said, "Man, this is a diverse, diverse squad. I want to be a part of that." Can you talk about how it felt coming into it, and, and as well as the fans? And there is the makeup of your team and how diverse your team does say a lot about uh, the organization. Um, and you know, a lot of times you see it on the field, right? And then. Frankly, you look over the bench and the staff, and it's, it doesn't look like that, right? That and I've been guilty of that at times. But to me, it's a, it, you know, it, it does start in my world um, when it comes to my job about the culture that we create there and how accepting are we. 
And there's always moments, there's always difficult moments where you need to make sure that you're willing to have some of the difficult conversations uh, that need to be had uh, when race comes into play, right? Uh, and I, I think I've been, I, I've been guilty, again, there's that word, um, of I, I, I think I've thought all along that I had a better pulse with my black players uh, than I did. And I, I sometimes, I think, have given uh, South American and Central American players that come here, I think I've, in a lot of times, giving them so much to feel at home and welcoming in our environment, in our culture, that sometimes I've um, let some of our black players down that I haven't been as in touch with them and asking uh, more about them because I, I felt like I got it because I've been in locker rooms all my life and I've coached black players. And in a lot of ways, as you guys know, Rodney and Charles, I gravitated towards the black players in the locker room. And, uh, so, uh, I, I, but, but I don't. I, I, I don't get it. And I, again, I, I think it's empathy. I think it's culture. I think it's listening. I think it's having hard conversations. Uh, and uh, as Charity said, having some self-reflection and being honest with yourself because uh, we can all do better. And uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Charlie. But Yeah, no, it, it definitely does. You know, I have Rodney, I think you can t you can speak on this as well. Um, you know, having those hard conversations with uh, your wife, you know, I, I, we have, you know, kids now, biracial kids, and having those those meaningful conversations of, you know, I, I've been married, I've been with my wife for 15 years. We've been, we've been married since 2012. We've never had a conversation about race in all that time, never. And I've let her, never let her know how I feel about when I'm getting in the car to drive, that I'm paranoid about where my wallet is every single time. And she thought it was just chalked up to be like, oh, you know, I'm a new driver because I didn't get my license till I was 28. And, you know, he, he's just a, a rookie driver and he's nervous about his wallet. No, I felt that I needed to have my wallet on me every single time. So when a police pulled me over, they knew who I was. Because if I could talk my way and say, hey, look, I'm Charlie Davies, I'm fresh with soccer player, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong. Whereas if I didn't have my wallet, then all of a sudden I can be anybody. And I felt like I'm opening myself up to, to get pulled out of the car, to get that knee on the neck, to, to be confused with somebody else because I look like a, a, a felon. And I, I've always felt that. And when I drive, anytime I see a police car uh, in my rearview mirror, my legs start to shake and I, and I feel like my stomach uh, goes into my, my, my throat. And I feel like that every single time. And I've never told anyone about it. And so having that real conversation, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like I dropped my whole life on her in the, in the past two weeks because she had no idea how I felt. And, and that's my wife. That's someone that I, I, I'm with every single day. So I can only imagine how it is for, for everyone else who, who doesn't have a, a black spouse or a black family member, you know? So um, Ronnie, if you could, you could speak on that, you know, what your, your dialogue's been and how Haley has been able to, to process everything. And, and what I got from, what I got from your side, it's also, you know, what we've done and I've, I've talked about it um, numerous times, but we kind of just put it to the side, right? Like it's whatever, you know what I mean? It's uh it is what it is. You know what I mean? She, she knows I'm black and, you know, things happen, you know, the police, you know, will pull us over and it might, you know, people might even crack jokes or whatever, but you know what I mean? It's real life. So with Haley, I mean, she, she, she's seen it. She's lived it. You know what I mean? Um, we, we had an incident where we were walking to get ice cream and our car pulled up basically right uh, in front of us to the side of us and they they threw a drink they threw a drink on us as they were they were as they yelled what they needed to what they needed to yell you know what I mean but they yelled the the a racial slur but she she's lived it bro so for her to see all of this right now is it gives her it gives her that same feeling and it's and it's kind of crazy to I look at her like wow like she's really 
she's really affected by it. And, and, I, and it's weird to look at it that way because at the end of the day, that's what the system has done for us, right? The system has, has told us that we look at white people different because it's like, oh, they're with us. Like, that's crazy that, you know, they're supporting us that much. You know what I mean? Just like in a, in a, just like in a protest, it's like, wow, like there's a lot of white people here, but that's, it, it shouldn't be that way because it, but it's what the system has done. But Haley, Haley has felt it for, uh, she's felt it. She's felt it in, uh, in different cities. We had an incident in New York city where, um, where I, I, we were cornered, we were cornered. Um, the guy was, I don't know what, what he was on or whatnot, but he was, he was calling me the M word and like basically cornering us down. I was trying to tell Haley to, to, I was like, go to that building and just stay there while I try to figure out what I'm going to do with this dude. But those are things that, that she's lived. And, you know I mean? Like being married uh, five years, I think that's a lot. I mean, those are things that, that shouldn't really be happening, but those are pretty heavy things and they, they stick to her. You know what I mean? And I got home from that incident and I almost didn't want to talk about it, bro. I just like sat there mm -hmm. and I, my heart was racing and I almost didn't want to talk about it because it, it was shameful. It was shameful to, to feel that, you know, and to have lived and for her to see that, you know what I mean? So I had to get it off. We had to, we had to talk about it because at the same time she was, she was feeling some type of way, but I mean, th this is real life. This is what's happening in America. This is what ha what's happening um, worldwide. And, and I'm happy that you and uh, you and Nina talked about it. You know what I mean? Because now it's up to you guys to, to pass it on to the twins. So we have to be as open as, uh, as we can be. And it's a new generation too. The internet is there. The kids are on the internet. They're going to see, they're going to see everything. So you might as well just, put it in front of them and say, this is, this is what's happening. And, you know, you have to look out for one another because you boys are, you know, of color and you might face some, some of these issues, but what the way that we can do our part is fight for that. So they don't have to go through the struggles we did. Yeah. As it seems like the overall theme is the youth. It's going to take educating the youth. And obviously, there's going to be a lot of people, grown people, that are going to have to take a look in the mirror. But it's good that the message is being shouted loud and wide in different countries in the world. Because now's the time. I think this is going to be a defining moment for our time. It's going to be a big defining moment. You're either going to be on one side or you're going to be on the other. So I think it's a I mean, I'm looking at that. Who, who would have thought that we would be doing this? You know what I mean? This is progress. This is movement. I we, look at, you know, I look at, I, there's certain things that I would say. Not me, Rodney. I mean, look, but you know what I mean? Like, look, we're talking to Ben Austin about it. You know what I mean? This is, we never would have thought that this, we, we would get to this point because we never thought that there would be change, you know? So now we're in this position. We got to keep going, like Bill said. I mean, what, mini, what uh, was it Minneapolis? What, have, what they've done with their police department? Los Angeles, the LAPD, they have defunded 150 million. I think New York's PD has already lost. 300 police officers have, um, about have already resigned, maybe because they feel something in their own hearts and they've defunded their police department, 300 million. So these little tidbits, I think, of changes that are happening around the country is progress. We have to take, we have to take those, these steps and we're, our time, our messages, our platforms, I believe are a big part of what's to come in the future because it's not gonna be tackled tomorrow. We're not gonna wake up tomorrow and the problem is done. But our message has been heard and it's gonna, be, it's gonna continue to be heard because we're gonna continue to fight and we're gonna continue to teach the kids that togetherness is the only way, it's the best way, you know? Yeah. We have to be together. Ch Ch Charity, could you speak to that a little bit of, of the messaging right now and some of the strategies that DC scores is, is using for those that don't know DC scores is in my mind, one of the best uh, nonprofits in, in the country and charity has uh, helped build that whole program and, and is a star there. And uh, 
can you just kind of go into kind of the, what you guys are doing at DC Scores to message this or uh, push push this along? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I agree. I think that one of the common themes, if not the most important themes um, that we, we're hearing is the importance of youth and youth voice. And at DC Scores, um, we amplify youth voice. We are um, after school program that provides free soccer, poetry, service learning programs to over 70 different schools in the district. And um, as director of creative arts and education of the organization, I oversee all the poetry and the writing components of the program. And normally right now we will be transitioning into our summer camps, but um, big shout out to COVID-19, we are doing our camp virtually right now. Um, and kind of really shifting our whole focus of programming. I think being in these weird times, it's, it's been a roller coaster as far as how, as far as how we were going, how we have, as far as how we have been and how we are continuing to approach um, our programming, dealing with equity issues, um, kids not having access to computers, not having access to um, stable internet connections, parents not being at home because now since they're laid off, they got to work. Uh, double jobs now having to maybe drive for uh, Grubhub, Uber Eats, who knows? Um, but the the life at home has changed, and so the way we are are shifting our programming is in a way to try to be as equitable as possible, but also to uh, encourage our kids to write and be um, able to express their emotions in the most safe and healthy way possible right now. I think that is so important and so key. Um, having this program has never been more important than in the, for the time that I've been at DC Scores ever. And um, we normally have like poetry slams, have the kids go and take their poems and write them with their team and then go perform and compete and have this huge showcase in front of everyone, which is great and that's fine. We're, we're encouraging youth voice and you wanna be heard and you have to know that your voice matters. But I think right now, encouraging kids to write for self, writing to journal, writing poems so that they can just get all these thoughts that might be up here onto paper, whether they keep that paper and hold it close to themselves and, and keep those thoughts with them, or even if they don't like it, they burn it, they can burn the notebook. We don't, you know, all that matters is that we are trying to encourage kids to um, take care of themselves emotionally during this time because it's a, I know I feel heavy going into work every day. You can't run from what's happening right now. Every no. it's on the news, it's nope. on social media. Everything. You go into the work talking about it is no way to run from it and I know how heavy I feel at the end of the day when I close my laptop and I'm like all right I'm clocking out I can only imagine how the youth are feeling right now and so that is why it's important for us to make them feel as safe in a, the most difficult time with social distancing and make them feel as connected and hopeful and I think we've been doing the best that we can do. Um, and with these summer camps, trying to create an, um, a virtual summer camp where we're, we're shifting the topics. We want them to talk about what are, they, what are they seeing on the news? How did that make you feel? Are you angry? Why do you feel angry? Write it down. Let's, let's talk about it. And, and making sure that they have mentors around them. Um, we are always, we are also looking for uh, mentors to come speak to them. So Charlie Davis, Rodney, Bill. Hey, right. Charlie, I, I've, done it, I've done it before. I've been, I've been part of those. Which, been part okay. Of the, the they the doing this since fourteen, big dog. You know, well, I mean, hey, since two thousand eleven. <laughs> okay, hey, all right. I'm gonna hold y'all to it, but but like mm -hmm. having mentors like y'all come talk to them and and um open up safe spaces for them to be able to talk about these things and have people that look like them that do things that they're passionate about as well. Um, let them know you're not alone. What you're feeling is okay and things are going to get better and i think that's been our main mission and you know it's been it's been rough it's been tough but you know it, it makes i've never enjoyed work as much as i enjoy it now i have my days but it's it's uh it's, sure, it's you, extremely rewarding you're doing an unbelievable job i know i know sean hinkle who's also in dc scores and you know i love what you guys do the impact you make you feel it benny can you talk about the i can't breathe honoring George Floyd at Audi Field and, and how that mm -hmm. came to be, the Black Lives Matter tribute, um, you know, really, it really, I think, hit everybody. You know, it, it really touched 
everybody to the core and um, and how that came to be. It, it was a powerful day, and I, I give uh, you know J Jason uh, Levy, and it, it was really important to him. He gave me a call in the afternoon on on Saturday and uh, wanted to do something uh, on behalf of the organization, and he wanted to make a real statement and. Uh, I think he reached out to Bill, right? I mean, you guys had a chat. I think he reached out to a few players and, uh, you know, had some discussions and then it kind of went from there. And it, it was, again, it was just a powerful day. Uh, families, uh, fans of the team, of the organization, uh, front office. Uh, I think 15 players showed up and they were grinding all week. That were, We were working their tails off all week and they had one day off on Sunday. Uh, but – uh, the turnout was amazing, and uh, it was also neat to see community, have this community feel of how quickly when you get together, you can do something so impactful, uh, right? I mean, it only took, it took four hours, three, four hours to do all that work, and it was collective, and we got something done, and, you know, maybe that's, you know, a, a little bit, if, if we magnify that, hopefully we can to take that to what's going on out there in, in this country and around the world and uh, uh, make things happen. Oh, it's magnified. Oh, it's magnified. Yeah. I've seen it on every yeah. sort of uh, media. Out I've seen it on media outlets. I've seen it on ESPN. I've seen it on everything. Anything that covers soccer around the world, I've seen it on, their, on one of their feeds. And I think that's the beautiful thing is when you see people of different color, you see young people, you see old people, you see parents, you see single men, people from different countries, and they all came together to support this cause and then to work together, just the, just the labor, in the heat, painting a field. I bet that's not even easy in itself, you know? I think that's that message, that message of togetherness, I think that's the message that is going to be a message we need to continue doing moving forward. We need to continue preaching togetherness in every aspect of our lives and, and, and staying as far away from hate as possible. And if there is hate, almost just trying to turn that into love. How can you turn hate into love when the hate is coming right at you in the moment? I think that has to be a message for kids too, is, you know, these kids, we're not gonna fix the problem completely for them. They're gonna have to have their own fight too, whatever culture, whatever race they are. They are. So how do we also educate them on, how do you deal with Hey, in the moment that will one protect you and somehow give that person that wants to give you so much hate a little tweak in the brain like maybe that wasn't right maybe that wasn't right. maybe that wasn't right you know so if we can do that hope oh, that's not me accidentally calling somebody by the way yeah. <laughs> I hope I'm not calling somebody who's gonna pick, who's gonna pick up who's gonna, gonna, gonna hang up God forbid <laughs> you better cancel that call cut to the blue screen <laughs> um, Charity is we uh it is it's about that time I'm uh looking at my watch they they, they tried to uh they, they told us to keep it to about an hour uh any chance, Charity? I know you, you've probably been putting some words on paper here through this oh, time. Yes. I've been in the studio kind of getting some of my feelings out on, on, on canvases. Uh, but I, I can't see that. Is that like one these. of yours behind you? Is that one this of yours is, right behind uh, you? This is my grandfather's piece. And uh, the title of this painting is uh, Involvement, uh, believe it or not. Uh, it's, a, it's a march. Uh, I'm assuming it's probably civil rights march, uh, and uh, it's uh, he was a wonderful artist. So I keep it there, uh, and it's been uh, very fitting during this time to have behind me. Uh, however, That's I'd rather cool. listen to Charity. You got anything for us to to uh, send us off? Send you home. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got you. Um, let me do something uplifting. Let's end on a good note, right? All right. So I like, I like this. That. Mo this poem's dedicated to my mother. Um, unfortunately, I lost her about four years ago. Um, and I think that when we lose people, sometimes we think that we cannot, we can no longer learn lessons. And I think even with uh, the death of George Floyd, I think a lot of people are learning lessons right now. And it shouldn't take that for that to happen. But I do think that 
just because someone's not here anymore doesn't mean we can't learn things. And my mother has taught me a lot of gifts and I and the one ways the ways that I can remember them, the ways that I can remember my lessons are through the me the precious memories that I still have of my mother. And one of the biggest gifts that she taught me was about giving. And so I dedicate this poem to her. Um and yeah, gift of giving. <clears throat> My mother told me that I should give and never question and never expect a dime in return. She said that giving is something that cannot be measured. It's a treasure, something like a gift because the gift of giving is an ancient tradition, a tradition as an extension from my ancestors centuries and centuries of feeling helplessness while still graciously displaying selflessness. She said, baby, this world will eat you alive and tear away at your soul so diligently and intentionally give the most when you feel whole to just trust me i know she would tell me how our ancestors gave us hope when they escaped to the north how rosa gave us resilience when she refused to move how james brown gave us pride when he said say it loud i'm black and i'm proud in the vibrant joy he gave us the way he shuffled and jived over racism you tell me about malcolm and Martin, how they gave us strength and patience, calm yet anxious, how Langston paved the pathway to us exploring our biggest, richest, most ambitious dreams. You would tell me how the Obama's nomination gave us validation that yes, we can, and yes, we did. You and Pops did not see eye to eye on everything. I remember what you said to him that day when he asked you, as you rolled the windows down, arms extended like the branches of a giving tree, green leaves falling to the hands of the homeless man. He asked you, sweetheart, why do you give them money? You know what they're gonna end up doing with it. You know what it's gonna go towards. You know we really don't owe them anything. You would sigh and reply, my love, who are we to judge? Because you understood that what it means to give is the epitome of what it means to live, to live is to serve, to serve, is to pay it forward in honor of ones before. She said that giving is something that cannot be measured. It's a treasure something like a gift because the gift of giving is an ancient tradition, a tradition as an extension from my ancestors. So I give like my life depends on it as if my ancestors gave me the keys to the chains to unlock the block freedom that flows through my veins as if Rosa gave me a seat at the front of the bus in the Jim Crow Ku Klux Montgomery. He as if James Brown gave me his feet, choreographed my every move to continue to prove that even resilience can be wielded with a two-step Motown smooth, a two-step Motown groove as if Langston helped me snooze, manifest my dreams, gave me the beams of light and darkness that burst at the seams as if my mother named me charity, which means love or the act of giving to those in need as if it's apparent that my parents gave me the foundation to serve to observe the absurd and give back to those who deserve more love than what the world's given them because life's thrown them to the curve so I bless them with these hands, this knowledge or these words so I give like my future depends on it even if giving takes its toll because you said baby this world will eat you alive and tear away at your soul so diligently and intentionally give the most when you feel whole because receiving something in return should never be your goal trust me i know thank y'all Ay, ay. beautiful <laughs> thank you thank you oh there you go listen that that's that, 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 hit, that hit the heart <laughs> big I love it. Oh, thank wow. you. Thank you. That was beautiful. I can't. We shouldn't even say nothing after that, man. That's the wow. perfect way. Let's go. To exit, yo. go. I just want to say I love each and every one of you guys. This critical conversation, we will continue to have them. Once we open this country, open this city back up, we're going to continue to do this. Let's not stop love, showing love to people. Let's not stop spreading the message all together as one. Anything can be done, you know. So let's. That was my little rhyme, Charity. Okay. <laughs> well, I love you guys. Well, you. I wish you guys the best. Okay, stay strong wherever you are. Love you guys too. All right. Much love. love. Well. Keep doing your thing, everybody. Thank you. Doing your thing. Thank you so much, y'all.